Pathfinder's implementation of spellcasting is just miles better than what we have in D&D 5e. Let's find out why. As it was with my first Pathfinder 2e video where I cover the basics of playing the game, I'm finding more and more that these systems add a ton of usability, flavor, and depth with just a slight uptick in complexity when compared with what I'm used to in D&D 5e. And the spellcasting is no exception. But first, let's put your minds at ease. A lot of this is still pretty similar. For example, there still exists the same schools of magic that you're familiar with. Abjuration, conjuration, divination, etc. Although, the spell lists that correspond to each class have been replaced with four different traditions that each correspond to a single list of spells that you'll get access to when you take a class that has access to spellcasting. These traditions are arcane, the logical and rational kind of magic that might be associated with a wizard, divine, the faith-filled and holy incantations that a cleric might wield, occult, the unexplainable and bizarre mysticism that bards may sing about, and primal, the natural and animalistic enchantments that a druid may call on to aid them. As I mentioned before, and might be obvious already, a spellcasting class will give you access to one of these traditions and the spell list associated with them. Typically, you'll draw your spells from only this list, but there are some special circumstances where you can take something from another tradition. And as you may be used to, you'll typically cast those spells using your spell slots that range from level one all the way to level 10, instead of level nine. And you'll gain more and more of those slots as your character grows in level. The actual progression of those slots will be largely similar to the norm in D&D 5e, and you'll still see your slots refreshed after taking an eight hour rest every 24 hours. But your class will convey something else to you along with your tradition when you take it, your spellcaster type. You'll identify as either a prepared caster, if you're a cleric, druid, or wizard, or a spontaneous caster, if you're a bard or a sorcerer. Prepared casters have access to their entire magic tradition spell list, but they must prepare spells from that list each day that correspond to the spell slots you have, and you must prepare spells more than once if you wish to cast them more than once. Unlike D&D, where a prepared caster can just use the same spell over and over again using all of their spell slots. Alternatively, spontaneous casters in Pathfinder 2e are able to learn a number of spells from their magic tradition spell list that are basically always prepared for them. However, they're mostly locked into those choices and there are some other downsides to being a spontaneous caster, which we'll touch on in just a moment. If this feels a bit restrictive so far, it should. It's no great secret that spellcasters in D&D 5e are vastly more powerful than their martial counterparts, and Pathfinder seems to rectify this by making their casters a bit trickier to pilot, still with upside potential, but less consistent results. Speaking of being a bit trickier, let's now have a look at upcasting spells with higher spell slots in Pathfinder 2e, or heightening a spell, as it's called. Heightened spells offer a myriad of advantages from extra damage to additional effects depending on which spell you're looking at and if heightening is even available for that particular entry. However, you cannot simply heighten a spell you know with a higher spell slot. In order to cast a heightened spell, you must either prepare it at a higher level if you're a prepared caster, or must know the spell at that higher level to cast it if you're a spontaneous caster. For example, if you know the fireball spell at third level, a prepared caster can cast it at any level above that so long as they prepare that spell at the new level. But a spontaneous caster must know fireball at fourth level to cast it at fourth level and must know fireball at fifth level to cast it at fifth level and so on. As for our beloved level zero spells or cantrips, they still exist in Pathfinder and they're actually way better too as they're always heightened to half your character level rounded up. And based on what I've seen so far, you'll want to be making use of your cantrips just as often as your leveled spells. But regardless of what you cast, leveled or non-leveled spell, be sure to add in a bit of flavor so that your magic plays uniquely through your character and adds to the gaming experience around the table. All these rules are important, but it's easy to forget that these small touches can heighten your good times. For example, I close my eyes and tune into the energies of nature around me. I trace an ancient sigil in the air as I speak the hallowed words of my circle and focus on my intent to learn the weather forecast for this area. I open my eyes as a ball of magical energy forms above my open hand, showing me the answer. If something like this feels a little out of reach or even stressful for you, 
then don't worry. This exact description is actually one of over 9,000 finely crafted descriptions for just about anything you might need in your next campaign in D&D or Pathfinder. And this video sponsor, Describe, is even expanding on all those services with all kinds of cool new add-ons like a library of immersive sound effects and music, as well as interactive maps, a module for Foundry virtual tabletop, and more. They've even offered a generous 10% off of your first month by following the link in the description below and using the code CONSTRUCTEDCHAOS at checkout. So thanks again to our friends over at Describe for the wonderful words, as well as sponsoring this video. Now, back to casting spells. So, as you might guess, there are also more ways to do magic in Pathfinder than just becoming a spellcaster. Martial and caster characters alike can attain focus spells that come from other feats and abilities and utilize focus points instead of spell slots, of which you may have from one all the way to three. Just like cantrips, these focus spells are automatically heightened to half your level rounded up, and one casting will cost you one of your focus points. You'll be able to replenish these focus points one at a time by taking the refocus activity over a 10 minute period so you'll typically have access to them in every single combat encounter. Finally, your spellcasting ability for these focus spells is the same as usual if you're a spellcaster, or you just use the ability listed with the feature that gave you the spell if you're a non-caster class. Seems a lot better than an entire multi-class dip just to get a little spell casting on your martial build, if you ask me. And similar to some of the species in D&D 5e, your character may also gain innate spells from their ancestry or from some magic item. These spells have a specified number of uses and conditions for use separate from spell slots and focus points, and your spellcasting ability for these will be charisma unless otherwise specified. Additionally, since this is an innate spell that's built into your character, you'll be able to replace any material components normally required in the casting with a somatic component. But more on that in just a moment. Finally, you can't use spell slots to cast innate spells that you have unless you also have those spells available as a spellcaster. Now, on to actually casting these spells. First, you'll need your spell components, which come in four different categories. Material components, which are physical items that get used up in the casting of a spell, even if it's unsuccessful. Somatic components, or hand gestures, verbal components, more commonly referred to as words, and focus components, which can be a wand, a holy symbol, or something else required by the spell for you to channel your energy through. Notably, D&D 5e allows you to replace material components in some cases by using a spell focus. However, in Pathfinder 2e, things are a little more restrictive as you'll occasionally need both and neither is interchangeable with the other. You should also know that while D&D 5e requires you to have a hand free for spells with a somatic component, Pathfinder doesn't. You can be wielding a sword or holding a shield, you just can't be restrained in such a way that you can't use your hands. There are some feats and abilities that allow you to change the baseline rules, but we won't cover all the specifics here. As a rule of thumb, specific rulings supersede general rulings. Moving on, spells typically take more than one of your three actions in a turn to cast, sometimes even longer, so there's even more disparity between casters and marshals that might be able to do more with their three actions on their turn. And there are some spells that can persist over multiple turns, pending your continued concentration on them. But concentration does not exist in Pathfinder in the same way that it does in D&D. Instead, they call it a sustained spell. To continue the effect of a sustained spell that likely causes you multiple actions to cast on a previous turn, you'll need to spend one action on each subsequent turn. That said, you won't have to make concentration checks to keep the spell up after taking damage, and you can be sustaining more than one spell at a time. It's kind of similar to sustaining this channel by using an action on both the like button and the subscribe button at the same time. Go on. Try it out. Good. Now that you're finally ready to actually cast a spell, there's a bit more that you should know. Just like in D&D, you'll be able to make spell attacks and impose spell saves from your enemies, but things are a little different here. Your spell attack modifier that you'll add to your D20 roll will be your spell casting ability modifier plus your proficiency bonus and plus any other bonuses or penalties you have. And your spell save DC that enemies will need to meet or exceed in order to avoid the worst is your spell casting ability modifier plus proficiency bonus, plus any bonuses and penalties you have, and plus 10. Yes, this does mean that your spell save DC will likely be a bit higher than what you're used to in D&D 5e. But don't forget, as I mentioned in my previous video, the saving throws of many creatures should be a good bit higher as well. And do also remember that spell attacks will still incur the multiple attack penalty, and that these spells can crit succeed, succeed, 
fail and crit fail on both spell attacks and saves outside of just rolling natural ones and natural 20s. And as many of you have likely come to expect, all of these spells will come tied with a type of target, object, creature, or otherwise, a range in which you can target, a certain size of area that they affect, and a duration that represents how long the spell's effects last. Nothing really changes here from D&D 5e. But what does change here is game balance. I mentioned it earlier, but Pathfinder 2e does a really great job of bringing casters back down from their lofty perch in order to level the playing field between them and martial classes. If you're coming over from 5e like I did, it may seem to you that casters are underpowered, but this is simply not true. The result is a more balanced game where it truly feels like each decision matters while additional flavor is allowed to bet itself within the slight increase of complexity compared to 5e. Speaking of, you'll probably want to check out this video next, where I cover the numerous conditions of Pathfinder 2e since your spellcaster is probably going to be inflicting these on your enemies. But until next time, go out there and make some chaos.